Hello, Dan. <laughs> Hello, Jack. Thank you for joining me. Um, it's a pleasure, as always. Should I put that there? Yeah, I'll put this here. There we go. Uh, yeah, pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> um, I'm going to say it again. Very cold. It sucks. It really, this week it really sucks, though. Okay. Because it's actually, today I went for a walk and I was wearing my mask and the moisture was going up towards my eyebrows and eyelashes and then freezing on my eyebrows and eyelashes. Uh-huh. And that was an experience I'd never experienced before. Uh, and it freaked me out. And so it's really cold. That's all I'm going to say on that subject for okay. now. How are you? Welcome you to our other kind of statements before. Some kind of outing to the Arctic this week? Or... <laughs> Did you go out today? You must have. Yeah, you had work. Yeah, yeah. It was chilly this morning, wasn't it? It was cold all it was day. Cold. It was cold. It was awful. Uh, yeah, I'm weathering it well, I suppose. Good I really noticed. Mm. I haven't really noticed. Mm. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> not at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no. I'm well, I think. Uh, uh, good. Very good. It's been a... Uh, a long week for me. Yeah, mostly. it's been a, it's been a, it's been a kind of like, just come home and hibernate. And yeah, yeah, I know. I've been feeling quite comfortable with the idea of just coming home and doing nothing. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I've been reading and things. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, preparing yeah. for the show, of course. Sure, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. which we do every day, all yeah, day, all the time, all the week. Only, the only thing that we ever do is think <laughs> about this show. Yeah, and then complain. Oh God, we just don't. We Haven't, just can't uh, prepare yeah. for the show. Yeah, yeah, can't yeah. read a whole book. Yeah. Um, we work all week and then profess our laziness. <laughs> exactly. Um, Tell me this, Jack. Um, oh. Was there or was there not an attempted coup in your country this week? I, uh, attempted coup? <laughs> my country this week. Which my which country. Is that Australia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If there is anyone listening Australia. from the government of the country that we're currently in, no, there was not a coup in Australia. The <laughs> oh, right, okay. That's, that's, that's <laughs> oh, but you were talking about the other country, yeah, the United States the of America. Um, I don't know. What should my take be on I this? I don't really know. I, don't, well, I, I, yeah, I have one take which I'm going to share in a minute, which is sort of... Oh. Uh, which is... Uh, it seems unpop- uh, maybe an unpopular take. An unpopular take? <laughs> oh, my God, Dan, hit me with your unpopular I think, take. Um, well, no, I do, I'll say that for a minute. No, no, no. Can I just say that I did... I haven't talked with you about this yet, so I'm going to confront you about this on the show. <gasps> I did see the footage of you with Meowgrith in Nancy Pelosi's office <laughs> forcing your cat to take a shit on her desk. I did see that, so that didn't escape my eyes. Yeah, what you didn't see is the police officer that was uh, taking a selfie with his office. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's fine. I mean, it's obviously clownish, the whole activity, really. Fair, sure. Um, and I suppose I thought it was solely clownish. Farcical one. But I su- farcical, perhaps, perhaps, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I suppose if it was an effort to, in some way, subvert the Constitution of the US, yeah. then I suppose it's a, an attempted coup, right? Is that your unpopular take? No, no, no. Oh. My, unpo- my, unpopular, my oh. unpopular take is that, like... Um, Drum roll, please. There was something aesthetically quite cool about the whole activity um <laughs> and i don't mean like obviously the the this the aesthetics of the trumpists for the most part are are quite vulgar of course i mean they have terrible flags yes and uh they're a peculiar looking bunch of people they are very peculiar looking um yes very sort of monochromatic yes um <laughs> And I just like just storming the halls of power and waving your flag sure, around, sure. climbing, climbing the highest height and waving your flag. Indeed. I mean, I'm down with in it. the lamest way with possible, it. with not a lot. Well, I shouldn't say not a lot of uh, an attempt to stop you because there was. Um, well, this is what this is what's troubled me a little bit. But from a lot of quarters, there seems to be a, have been a lot of emphasis put on the desire to have these people be stopped. Yeah. Which obviously, sure. like, I mean, I don't mean these people in terms of, like... Deplorables. The, the, the Trump <laughs> lunatic. No, I don't want to say that. Like, <laughs> the most the most avowed supporters of Donald Trump. Yeah. Um. But, like, but like, but like with, with that... It's sort, of, sort of perhaps without sufficient caveat, asking the question, like, where are the police? Where yeah. are the, the sort of enforcers of these things? Yeah. As if they perform some kind of noble role, but I don't know. I was thinking of tying this into our talk last week, right? Like, um, when the we were, perhaps, yeah. no, when we were talking about um, defending the established constitutional order, sure, from fascism, sure. Um, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. Is 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 this an example of a time when one ought 
um, stand with oh, the I Constitution of the United States and defend uh, the integrity of American con- d- democracy mm. from fascist assault. Presumably, I, sp- I suppose yes, except that 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 fascism is so clownishly ridiculous that yeah. it's hard not to laugh. Here's the thing. Also... I'm I'm having a hard time. Uh, yeah, okay. We always do our best to make the show not just like a current events hot take thing, but fuck it. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Why not? It's just been on my mind a little bit. Sure. I've been, as a kind of like slow, I've done a slow spooling up over the past few days. Sure. So I heard that it was happening. Soaking I, up I information. I sort of took no interest. Sure. And then I gradually sure. sort of like, it's it's, it's just, I'm, we're, we we just happen to be recording this exactly the right distance from yes. the event. That to I'm be sort of like peaking in my <laughs> level of interest. Sure. I am having a hard time. I mean, if it comes across as like we spend too much of this podcast talking about this current affairs, uh, current event, uh, then we could cut it. Yeah, well, for the sake of like saving face, sure, or sure. Like brand, in- or something brand happens. integrity, or something. <laughs> something, something happens, happens in, in a week. week. Yeah, <laughs> there is an actual. Clue. Yeah, exactly. In which case, what I'm about to say will sound very silly, because I'm having a hard time trying to figure out if this was just like mixture of. Stupid protest, gone, kind of like even stupider in the sense that the guys were all crazy. They're all crazy people. I shouldn't gender the group. They're all crazy people, and they got a little too crazy, Folks. and the cops were just like, oh, you know, just, sure, come on in, whatever. And if it was just that, or if, it, you know, you should be like, oh, my God, it's a coup. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go so far as to say that, sure. but I mean, like, it's kind of what you're saying. Is it something that we should be more like, oh my God, about than just like a bunch of idiots storming the Capitol building? Yeah. AOC was like, I'm okay, guys. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all very tiring. I mean, there are there are some. I mean, there are some obvious. There. Are, I mean, there are there are some obviously bad takes and some obviously good takes. There are obvious like things that should seem alarming, like the disparity and yeah. how this protest was policed of over other notable protests. Perhaps not surprising. It's like it's alarming how the sort of like liberal centrists are sort of talking about coups in America without any recognition of how they've seeded coups all over the world. Yeah, or and like how I, the United States has this history of seeding coups all over the world. And like and how they haven't been profiting off of off of Trump this entire last you know ten yeah, yeah, years. The, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's or, like please. Yeah, or the, the, yeah that 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 um, these people do nothing other not than only, complain about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only do the right kind of like have the, not only have the right various aspects of the right, not just Trump, been building up this narrative, which has like resulted in the events of whenever it was Wednesday, yeah. But also like how the Democrats have played into being the sort of reflection of that in yeah. their sort of like um, passivity, disgusting, yeah, yeah. It, 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 you're just quite happy to accept the role of being outraged, yeah. Um, but no more, nothing more than that kind of thing. Right? Let's since we're talking about this, let's crank it up to eleven. Ooh. Let's make some predictions. Oof. Let's let's make some alternate histories. Okay. Um, people have been talking about the Republican Party splitting uh, in two now, right? With the people who are like, "Damn, the voters like Trump, obviously, because that's what we've been priming the pump for, um, for like ever, right?" I go back to our Reagan episode to hear about that. Do you see a future where the Republicans who are kind of like uh, the opposite of that, the ones who are like, oh my God, I can't believe Trump would do this. I can't believe this is who our base is. Kind of siding with the like Democrats now and the, and the Democrats being like accepting their role out in the open now as like a right wing kind of like center right kind of party. And then like, because of that vacuum, maybe something opening up for the left where it's like, obviously someone like Bernie didn't have the uh, cojones so to speak, to, like, actually split the Democratic Party up. AOC, someone like that, would never do it. People, you know, the, like, squad, right, is never going to do that. Mm. How do you see the kind of political landscape maybe changing? Mm. Will it change? I, or I are mean, these Republicans I'm just not, lying? I'm not student of it enough to know necessarily. Uh, but let's like, just That guess. caveat aside. I mean, I suppose <laughs> it is an interesting proposition, right? I suppose the proposition you're making is if the, the, the establishment right mm. and the centrist Democratic left... Yeah. In quotes, kind of thing. <laughs> um, continue in an effort to make some kind of like compact. Mm. Um, 
so so I suppose the scenario is that the the mainstream Dems and the mainstream Republicans are drawn closer together, mm. and then it leaves these two vacuums on both poles. Yeah. For sort of new. Uh, and they think of formations to form, and I suppose it's it would be interesting. It's interesting, like we've talked about splits in one party. Well, people have talked about splits in one party or um, splits in the other, or um, trying to foster a dirty break yeah. from in, in the Democrats kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, I suppose there is a question of like how the two might play into one another kind of thing. Like, yeah. could you have a, a a reformation of the American party system? Mm on both wings at the same time kind of thing mm. or does one does is that the most likely icon right like one happening both happening at the same time and there being this mutually inciting event which is yeah um what do you think's gonna happen <laughs> let's hear it make a guess why not <laughs> who cares um, i'll tell you my hot take after you go. um um it's hard right because my in- inclination is to say that the bulk of the republican party want to advocate for decency shall we say yeah but how stupid do you have to be to be a republican saying that you know what I mean? yeah but but uh, so it's e- so it would be easy for me and i would initially be inclined to say well the republicans are going to hold some kind of coherency together maintain coherency because of that fact mm. but then also you've got to look at the sheer number of people who just voted for trump and be like exactly that's got to represent some kind of social <laughs> yeah, of base course. and do you want to um move toward representing that social base. But I suppose the question is then, um, is it possible to imagine a political formation which both speaks to that Trump Trump voting base mm. and also speaks to a sufficiently large proportion of the American ruling class that you could have some kind of like um, alliance between the two kind of thing? Yeah. Presum- I mean, presumably the the... Uh, American capitalism is still quite happily represented by the Republican Party. Sure. Um, so I guess to some extent your question might be what kind of disillusionment could happen with the within the ranks of the American capitalist class that might lead them to want to support a political formation. Or just take power into their own hands. Trump, right? Do a little Trump smedley butler. As their base kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, it's a Bush family thing. Classic. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think, like I said, you would have to be kind of crazy if you're a Republican to be like, uh, I'm going to side. Unless unless that was like your thing, right? You were like going to be the person to side with the Democrats because you would have to, right? Like, and if you're going to do that, presumably you'd want something from them, which is like the Democrats, honestly, just acting like they always have been, but making some kind of concessions to like shitty social policy or something like that. Want to hear my hot take? Please. I had a flash Please. of this. Enlighten me. Um, today. Um... Blinded by the flash of your own Blinded by the <laughs> flash of my own big brain. I was sitting on my brain and I thought of this. <laughs> um, if Trump continues to be like a threat, quote unquote, like if he runs in 2024 or whatever, and like ev- all the liberals get to the point where they're like, oh my God, oh my God, we just need to do something. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And like the thing that they need to do isn't like the obvious answer of like supporting left policies. Um Obama could be president again. <laughs> just watch it happen. All I'm going to say. Watch it I've happen. I've wondered this before. Um, does the the Constitution just prohibits con- t- more than two consecutive terms? It's, it's two terms, you can't do it. You can't, you can't do, do a third term. Yeah, under yeah. Any but they'd be willing to issue that if the, that. Threat, <laughs> if the threat was or Trump. Oh, I see what And they you, were like, yeah, yeah, they yeah, wouldn't yeah, vote yeah, for yeah, anybody yeah, but yeah, Obama. Yeah, yeah, if they're like... Um, the return of the king. Because Yeah, because, the, because their rhetorical desire is to like unite the country. <laughs> um, and always really what they're trying to do is unite the country around the right kind of leadership or the right kind of like political performance rather than an actually transformative collection of policies kind yeah. of thing. Um, you can imagine the desire. Sure. I can fully imagine. I mean, it already exists, right? Oh, yeah. The kind of like, the like... desire to have have Obama be president again. People Obama, were talking about Michelle Obama forever. Yeah. It's like, oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Mm. Michelle Obama 2024. 20, 20 or 20, whenever. I don't know. Maybe I think. not 2024 because been... Harris. Can you imagine? Can you imagine <laughs> Michelle Obama and Kamal. What's her name? Harris. Yeah, is that Harris, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Oh, Debating boy. in the Democratic primary in oh. 2022 three. Debating who was a worse person yeah, in terms yeah, of policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Michelle's like, I was wrong. I should have been making the children fatter. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. 
uh, crazy though. You're right. And it was just to see that happen. It was kind of like I've been to DC. Actually, I was a just a times, bit like, and it was crazy. Okay, yeah, whatever. It's like, Ex- yeah, same. I was a bit like, oh, it's a protest, and they've sort of like they've got it into somewhere. And yeah, like it's all, it's all. It it I feel, felt kind of like I don't know I I, I don't I, I don't suppose I have anything to compare it to to say that it felt normal but it, it felt kind of normal I yeah. was just a bit like all right then yeah yeah, yeah. I know the one thing that blew my mind was it seemed to be some histrionics going on yeah and I was a bit like yeah but I mean I I sort of understand that now the 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 point of my reflections over the past few days was like <laughs> okay this could have it does have a serious tone to yeah. it kind of thing which could legitimately be felt to be troubling. And I suppose it's that conflict, isn't it, between like the clownishness and yeah. the sort of like more serious overtone and the tone of it. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. The farcicalness, the laughability of it all, the characters involved. I did say the thing that kind of made me go, whoa, was like when I saw the person that the cops killed, one of the people that the cops killed, the person that they shot. <laughs> Have you seen mm-hmm. a photo of her? Mm-hmm. She's like this little tiny old lady. Okay. Totally, like the photo of her is like she has no idea where she is. Yeah. She's just like, wow, Donald Trump, the Capitol building. And they just effing blipped her, oh, no. dude. It's just <laughs> yeah, like... I don't know anything about the circumstances. of Yeah, because I heard several, I thought I, I I thought I heard that several people had died. Yeah. But maybe several people were shot. Apparently a cop died. Put... Okay. I don't, I don't yeah, get we that. Really don't know anything, I don't really know anything about this. Yeah, current events. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will say, though, call me crazy. Cops sh- shouldn't murder old women. Sure. Call me nuts. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Secret yeah. Service shouldn't murder old women, whoever yeah. it was. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe this was... Bec- yeah. they. Ne- I, I suppose my sense of it is there never seemed to be any threat. Uh, maybe that's why it feels familiar, right? Because mm. it's just like... It's just... It's just protest. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously they pretend, they obviously quite a number of them potentially had guns. Obviously there were reports sure. of like improvised explosive devices. So obviously there was threat, but I yeah. suppose the images that I've seen just seem like, like it's just an occupation of a space for a little while, and they're yeah. all having fun and they're taking selfies and they're sitting in chairs and yeah. they're, they're they're ranting from the speaker's chair and whatever and like yeah that was funny you. yeah it's neat it's neat it's a bit neat. Um... Um, there were some pretty gnarly images, though, coming out of, like, the security guards who were, like, attempting to stop the people. Just being, like, chased. Like, that was gnarly. Oh, really? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, crazy. Yeah. I'm beginning to think that this Trump guy, his supporters, aren't all on the level. Okay. okay. <laughs> Call yeah, me yeah. crazy. Not all there. I'm beginning to remember... Are, were, wait a minute, Dan. Were these the same people who voted for George W. Bush? They couldn't have been. I know these weren't the same people who voted for John McCain. He was a respectable veteran, okay? These were not the same people who voted yeah, they're, for... They're, yeah, uh, but yeah, they are the same people that voted against Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love I love Mitt Romney being like, well, just any effing Republican or Democrat, quite frankly, being like, oh, I can't believe what's happening. And it's like, Mitt, you were the nominee, like, so recently. Like, you, oh my God. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, nobody involved in American politics at any level in any capacity has any relation to these events. Or any these right to be surprised. <laughs> to be like pearl clutching, like, yeah. where did these people come from? I, I, okay, so I did used to, one, the last thing I'll say about it is that I did used to be totally on board with the whole, like, I read something that Chomsky did like four years ago when Trump first got elected. And he was basically saying, you know, think of all these Trump people as like, uh, he used this metaphor he got from someone else. It was like, imagine everybody in America in a line and like Oprah's at, and Jeff Bezos are at the front and like some schmuck is at the back. But he was like, imagine Trump voters as people who perceive as like they're trying to get ahead in life and the things that they perceive as like unfair, like people breaking the rules are ahead of them first, right? So like they perceive immigrants as like breaking the rules, whereas they're just following the rules. And so they're able to capitalize on this racism politicians are and blah, 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 blah. And I was a little bit more like optimist well not optimistic understanding of trump people in the way where it's like these are people in states who've just been completely left behind nobody cares about them a lot of these people (laughs) i'm just gonna make huge generalizations but it's like a lot of these states have opioid epidemics infrastructure sucks they get nothing they're totally right to complain about coastal elitists totally right to complain about democrats and the only people doing anything to channel this anger are republicans right in just the most disgusting deplorable way i still kind of think that but so many of these people are just racists, dude. Just mm. effing, just disgusting, despicable, chubby, portly. The people you kind of just want to like, you know that scene in The Simpsons where Dr. Hibbert like pokes Homer and he's like, we'll see how long he juggle for. And he's like, cancel my three o'clock. It's like that. It's like these just fat people. It's not one thing of like a proud boy who got maced and he was just like this fat ginger dude. Love gingers. 
Not saying anything bad about gingers, but it was funny. It made it extra funnier that he was ginger. Uh, 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 uh. All I'm saying, these people It, it, compl- it complemented his overall sort of string vest aesthetic. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> With like the chicken on the front. And he was just like, my eyes really hurt. It was just like, oh my god. <laughs> uh-huh. Um... Crazy week, I guess. You know what's funny is that the episode that just went up today, I think at the very beginning, one of us was like, not a lot's happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I suppose we ought to. I mean, obviously, we sometimes like make reference to the fact that we say certain things now which might be out of date a week mm. away. But mm. we should also acknowledge the fact that our, like, we, we are completely incapable of saying things about what has happened in the week when the episode actually comes up. Kind of yes. So, uh, so our lack of saying something should also... Uh, our lack of ability to speak to future... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> should We're be not no- pre should people. be noted. I suppose. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It should, yeah, it should be, also be a caveat that we put on those episodes. That the- so much more stuff's going to happen by the time this comes out. Trump did just say, I'm not going to the inauguration, which is setting up not the best president, perhaps. <laughs> but it's like, did we expect him to go and just sit there and be like, He's oh, actually going to be barricading the doors <laughs> to the Oval Office. Exactly. Um, last bit of news. On a somber note, just, well, this did just happen. Uh, Tommy Lasorda, Dan, who you do not know, uh, manager of the Dodgers for a very long time, um, it's always been a very fat, overweight, unhealthy man. Did he get um, the better of him? Huh? No, no, go on. No, he died. Okay, yeah, no, <laughs> he got the died. better of him. <laughs> oh, it got the, yes, it definitely did. Um, shame. Don't think he was exactly someone who I would want to represent baseball. And he's definitely a lot of this. He, whenever I think of Tommy Lasorda, because I wasn't around for the 1988 World Series, whenever it was. But I always kind of imagine him as someone who was like, they don't play the game the right way, which is like, they're Cuban, is what he means. <laughs> right. <laughs> Having said that, R.I.P. Tommy Lasorda, um, I'm wearing my Puig jersey right now, and I probably won't think about him again for a long time, but thank you for bringing a little bit of happiness um, to an otherwise kind of depressing city, because L.A. is pretty brutal. So thank you, Tommy Lasorda. Thank you, Kurt Gibson. Oh, um, still alive, I think. And should we begin the show? Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Um, I love our reading for this week. Yeah. This was a bit of a, kind of like a late call, but like, man, I really, really dug this. Yeah, what I was really reading? delighted as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Please, yeah. please to be reading it, filling in, please to be filling in those gaps in my lack of understanding. Mm-hmm. It felt like a, yeah, it felt like something that was both good to be reading and also easy to absorb. Yeah. And, um. Potentially useful. I suppose so, yeah. For something. We'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> um, if we ever end up trying to sort of like organize an exceedingly complex system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, some sort of Wallace and Gromit device to put on my pants in the morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this week we read the first couple chapters of Eden Medina's Cybernetic Revolutionaries. Cybernetics, it's been kind of like the new, well, not new thing, but it's been like the fad on the left recently to talk about cybernetics. It's hip. It's hip. It's hip. Mm-hmm. We're talking the hip things, folks. Don't say we don't talk about current events because we talk about what happened last week and 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and also in the late 80s. Yeah, exactly. So cybernetics, uh, what is it? Indeed, what is it? I feel like every time I tried to get a good understanding of it, I was a little bit more confused, even though like I generally understand this book and everything, but like cybernetics, study of systems, potentially how machines can relate to uh, other systems, right? <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. systems is also just vague. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I don't know. Uh-huh. I mean, I, 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 I feel like it's a, um, I mean, one, um, I mean, this, this book's full of sort of myriad definitions at different times. Obviously, mm. it was a developing... Uh, science and I, I imagine continues to be a developing science sure. so it's sort of like it's uh, de- its definitions and its applications have been sort of like a sort of sedimentary process of uh, mm. collecting together relevant things mm-hmm. um, <laughs> yeah I, thanks. I guess my my 
my broad understanding, my broad definition that comes from my limited new understanding would be to say that it was basically just an approach to um, understanding the functioning of complex systems, which both sort of combines together a, a or try, attempts to build a science that can both understand uh, the operation of mechanical systems, the opera operation of organic systems, and also potentially the operation of like larger social systems as well. And systems can, systems is super vague because it's like systems theory. You can kind of apply to anything because it's like a human cell is a system, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. in the way that different parts of it work together. Um, a uh, human being is a uh, system, uh -huh. uh, but also an economy is a system, a corporation is a uh -huh. system. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And those also, but also like mechanical devices of various Absolutely, types are yeah. a doorknob are systems, doorknob entirely, mm. exactly. <laughs> um, and so, what we're what we're reading, what cybernetics revolutionaries is, is it's part his. Well, I guess it's kind of just all history, isn't it? I guess. I guess. Bit. I guess. I. I... I'm, I'm, I was going to give it a definition, but I feel like I've probably read this definition somewhere describing this book. So oh, maybe it's actually how the book is described. <laughs> it's kind of like a history of Chile's experiment with attempting mm. to plan its economy mm. based upon principles informed by a particular type of cybernetics. Yeah. Um, and it's a history of that experiment mm. to some extent. So the book combines very well um, a combination of well, a history of the events. Sure. The historical events. I just didn't want to say history historical <laughs> twice, um, but also like biographies of the in, the important parties involved, and then also uh, biographies and histories of the theoretical and academic ideas, mm. um, and it combines them together like they're all sort of meshed on top of one another. Yeah. So um, it's quite hard for us to um, quite often what we do is adapt the structure of a piece to inform how we structure our episodes. Mm. Uh, but the, this this book, although it's, it's written in a very enjoyable way, jumps about quite a lot. I'll have a few paragraphs, sort of like a bit of a biography of this person. Yeah. And then we'll jump back in time a little bit to yeah. describe this economic history of this particular country. And then we'll have a really detailed explanation of the history of cybernetics. And then we'll have a little bit more yeah. on Chile. And then we'll jump back a little bit to yeah. like some stuff about some of the people involved. What did Stafford Beer eat? Oh, yeah. now we're back to like Pinochet. Ah. <laughs> um, but it, I mean, it would be easy. It would be possible to just read this book and compile an episode entirely about the sort of like the interesting anecdotes and wa wacky character yeah. traits yeah. of some of the people involved. Absolutely, I'm I'm, I'm very much endeared towards Stafford Beer. I know, my God, <laughs> this like drunken yogi alcoholic, <laughs> just weirdo, but like so cool. Yeah, 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 and somehow like heavily involved in this sort of very professional environment yeah. of like uh business management yeah but all, but also like somebody who clearly seems to fashion himself to some extent or has been described as you say as this kind of like um yogi kind mm. of um cigar smoking whiskey drinking yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. so so there's a there's, there's a quote at one point when he's somebody describes him as being a combination of like oscar wilde and socrates <laughs> yeah um, there was also another description of him that was just simply one crazy gringo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, before we get too into it, let's give a little bit of background, I guess, on Chile and about what was going on and about the situation that this guy, Stafford Beer, came into, who he was, blah, 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 blah. So hop in any time, but I guess we should probably start by saying that Salvador Allende is kind of the main character of the story. Salvador Allende and Stafford Beer. Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile, um, I don't remember, 70? Yes. Yeah, 1970, first democratically elected socialist leader of Chile. Um, and he came to power at a time when his country's economy was heavily reliant on oligarchs, right? Chilean oligarchs and um, uh, just kind of like basic dependency theory. Like it was a poor country, very impoverished. So a lot of its technology and its um, kind of like mining rights that weren't owned by uh, oligarchs in, in, in Chile were owned by foreign multinationals. So not a lot of the wealth that the country made created, and it created a lot of wealth, was being recirculated into the country, and that showed. He came to power in a country that was like very poor, very impoverished, and huge wealth disparities and gaps. So he came to power with a coalition of, um, he himself was not a communist, but he came to power with a coalition of communists, of different kind of like vague socialisty people, 
Um, and also some like splinter Christian Democrats. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. Like, who could kind of see that things weren't great and they were like not happy to be in the same room as communists, but like yeah. presumably Stafford Beer wasn't either. Or not Stafford Beer, I'm sorry. Uh, Allende. Allende, yeah, I'm not sure actually. I think maybe he was a socialist of some sort. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah I think yeah. his coalition was like his socialist party. Sure. And then the communist party. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's important to emphasize, I mean, it's going to be. Uh, should we develop this story over future episodes mm. uh, crossed. through future readings of the book um, I think the, the fractious relationship between the various elements of his coalition yes. are going to become quite important I mean they, they, they are brought up already in some parts of this um, the communist party are taking one approach toward how the nationalisation should be conducted and how yeah. they how the new um, national economy should be organised. Exactly. Sort of like pulling in a different direction, pulling in other directions kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I suppose also worth pointing out that he won by a very slim yeah. margin. And also I think it was quite, a, it was a three-way split, so he didn't even mm. have a majority. I think it was kind of a plurality of the vote. Sure. Um, what was interesting to me to some extent was there was, it always it felt... I don't know whether you got this impression. It felt to some extent like there was a little bit of a continuity as well that was happening. Like the the, the Christian Democratic or the, um, administration that preceded him were already trying to make some efforts to um, over overhaul the economy. Yeah. Both to make it more socially just and also to modernise it to some extent. And I think to bring it under um, more... Uh, under state control to some extent as well yeah um so i think his election um was spearheaded propagated to some extent by the failures of that effort or the perceived failures of that effort mm. um but quite a lot of the sort of like apparatuses of state that um allende and um his government and his ministers were taking over were ones which already had some kind of um, legacy through the 60s because there, there was this reform yeah, process that was going on. Yeah, it seemed even before that too, right? Sorry? It even seemed like before that too, like there were she alludes a bit in the book to um, kind of like projects in the 30s that were kind of like maybe she was, when this was just when she was talking about getting, when they were getting computers into the country and about how they were originally going to use these like early versions of computers or computing systems I should say um, and how some elements in those previous governments were considering using them to help out with planning an economy, maybe. Sure. Maybe not planning an economy, but like with just, you know, getting information to the government's desks. Yeah, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there is a portion in the second chapter of this where um, the, the, the hit Chile's history with um, computer technologies is sort of outlined in, a, in relatively extensive detail for the mm. extent that to the extent that this book is detailed in any respect. Um, and yes, you get the sense that, that, that Chile does have this long history with trying to embrace computer technologies um, such as they existed at the time um, and to incorporate them into um, state, craft, state craft to some extent. Mm. Um, mm. They, the earliest reference to it in the book is when they, want, they wanted to um, use... Um, I've forgotten what the right word is, but mm. some primitive computers in the 30s to aid in their efforts to conduct a nationwide census. To, yeah. To begin with kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. So, yeah, I mean, that kind of sets the tone for what Allende is trying to do. So when he gets to power, he immediately realizes that the economy can't keep going on like this, right? Because it's not making the country any money and all the people are extremely impoverished. And he's like, oh, this is bad. Mm -hmm. So... He immediately sets about nationalizing a lot of stuff really, really quickly, right? Um, and so this includes kind of taking a control of copper mines away from oligarch families. Um, uh, what were some of the other sectors that he was nationalizing? Basically, it talks a lot about mines, transportation factories, that kind of thing. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, like most um, efforts of nationalization in developing countries in the 20th mm -hmm. century, a lot of the rhetoric was around securing for the populations of those countries the benefits and dividends of yeah. the national re resources of that country yeah. and not having those that be wealth either be hoarded by local oligarchs or be sh shipped yeah. out kind of thing yeah um i mean it, it, yeah it, the book explains to some extent that they had this kind of like two-tiered approach to nationalization they wanted to nationalize fully the kind of like commanding heights mm. um but also then start to part nationalize um they they, they, they certain other um sectors of the economy um 
But what was really interesting, one of the problems they had was that um, there were quite a lot of nationalisations that were forced not by the government, not by the ANDA administration, but by workers in factories themselves taking yeah. over those factories kind yeah. of thing. And so it's one of these things that um, the government were battling against was like they were being forced to take responsibility for um, uh, companies and factories that they hadn't even factored into their planning exactly, for yeah. how they were going to sort of like and as socialist, uh, direct like, this oh, kind cool. of wieldy thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was, yeah. I mean, it, um, it, there were points in the book where, um, well, maybe we should set the scene a little bit. One mm-hmm. of the things about um, that made Allende different or made Allende's aspirations uh, different was that he really didn't want to take the um, well, he, he described himself as a, as a democratic socialist yeah. um, and really wanted to avoid sort of taking the Soviet route of uh, being authoritarian in any way, both mm. using having authoritarian control over the economy, but also sort of like applying authoritarian practices to yeah. politics and government as well. Yeah. Wanted to maintain democracy, wanted to protect the democratic elements of the Chilean constitution um, and wanted to maintain or promote um, Freedom. democratic control in mm. uh, industry mm. and, as you say, yeah, generally mm. um, promote and protect yeah. freedom and liberty. Yeah. Um, One thing I will say, though, about, like, the Soviet model, and we can talk about this a bit more, but it's like, I, I, I'm not going to pretend to know a lot about Soviet history, but I feel like when people use the term authoritarian in reference to their economic planning, because that's, you know, like one of the main ideas behind socialism is at least at first plan an economy so that you're not just relying on market farms, blah, 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 blah. But it's like calling Soviet Union authoritarian in its economic planning. I feel like it gives it a bit too much credit (laughs) because it's like, it was mainly black markets and they didn't really know what they were doing. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, And I suppose to some extent Chile, um, I mean, obviously it it wasn't able to um, fully realize the aspirations that it had. Yeah for for a planned economy but they at least had the example of the soviet union to look at and be like Don't okay we're definitely not doing <laughs> yeah, that exactly <laughs> and i mean obviously um the soviet union had to uh, i would i would yeah i think i would imagine i'd like to say made errors but also to some extent they were forced errors yeah. um, based on the conditions under which course, they were yeah, operating yeah, sure. yeah yeah um Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Yeah, blah, yeah, blah, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll read some more things and yeah. find out. Stuff. Leave us there is a, there is a section on this because I've, I've been reading this and sort of asking myself, why how, why hadn't the Soviet Union done this? Yeah. Um, and I had some idea of why that was the case. But then yeah. um, there is a section in this where, it does, where the author does discuss um, planning in the Soviet Union mm. and um, the fact that there were efforts made to uh, combine sort of like cybernetic thinking and uh, computer technologies yeah. Um, to start to do some amount of planning. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it seemed to be what scuppered it was sort of resistance on a lot of levels. There was yeah. general resistance from the established bureaucracy. People didn't really want to lose their um, sure their the, the, the positions class, of privilege that they out. had. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to lose their positions of privilege that they had in the bureaucracy. Um, so to some extent, I guess Chile benefited from the fact that they didn't have that in, in place already. Kind of yeah. thing. Like the Soviet yeah. Union had once failing. <laughs> but sort of functioning to some extent system um yeah uh, the, the way that the book describes the Im- implementation of computer technologies into the soviet union was that like all the sectors developed there did start to incorporate um computers into yeah. their operation and organization but none of that information was shared between any of these sectors and they were all operating both with technology and with software hardware and software that were inca- incompatible between the various systems kind of thing so yeah. they ended up with just a, a, an economy that was incapable of being um, planned in the fashion that I almost said centrally planned but the mm. idea of behind this form of planning is that it's not necessarily centrally <laughs> we'll driven, get there. We'll but get like, there. Yeah, it's not um <laughs> It was incapable. Yeah, the Soviet uh, industry was incapable of being planned mm. in the fa- in the form of fashion that is being proposed was being proposed for. Yeah, uh, Allende's Chile. Yeah, so Allende's whole thing was trying to find what he called a third way. Mm. But the other third thing, but the, the, the reason the, <laughs> the reason why I thought it was useful to um, elaborate um, Allende's desire to have his revolution be democratic. Yeah. 
um, was that one of the things that he had clearly promised uh, in his, when he was about to be elected was that the process of nationalizations would be centralized. Yeah. And it, for a little while, I was like, why? Why is he advocating the sort of like uh, centralized organization of the nationalization process when mm. he's also all about sort of like yeah. uh, democratic in its form? But I, I I interpret that to mean like it was an effort to. Uh, suppress panic amongst the sort of capitalist class that <laughs> yeah. mobs would be at their well. doors taking taking all their stuff and yeah. yeah it was a mixed bag on that front like obviously there were some forced nationalizations yeah um, but the, ge- the general desire was to be able to um centrally coordinate this transitional process to a socialist economy yeah 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 so let me hit, let me hit you with a quote about that because like we said i ended tr- started trying to nationalize everything that was kind of just exporting wealth away from the people, right? And so, to kind of cut forward a little bit, eventually, a guy named Fernando Flores, who was one of his... I don't know if he was a minister, if he was just someone that was working with him, kind of like an advisor or something like that. Um, he, was, he was head of... I forget what the actual Corpo company was Corfo. called, but yeah, he was head of the uh, the institute, the technological institute for the government. kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. So he was kind of bit of a nerd, and he was reading some uh, cybernetics theory, and he came across this dude named Stafford Beer, okay? So to just set this up a little bit, Stafford Beer was like this guy, this British weird, as we said, yogi alcoholic, who came out of the private sector entirely. He wasn't really an academic at all at this point, um, but he'd been writing a lot about cybernetics, and he was specifically working with, like, how you could structure corporations and companies in better ways, ways that were, like, not necessarily more democratic, so to speak, for the sake of worker control, um, because he wasn't a socialist at this point, but just because it would work better, mm-hmm. right? And so Fernando Perhaps Flores... maybe, like, you describe it as an effort to have it be organic to some extent. Sure, yeah, yeah, in yeah. That, like, he was taking his, like, his model yeah. for how a complex system would work would be one that was, like, similar to an organic system. Or yeah, and one system. one where information is flows a lot easier than the typical, like, worker, supervisor, manager, hierarchy. You know what I mean? So um, this kind of sets up this quote where, like, what Andy was trying to do, I guess, when he first got to power. So it's a, what's her name? Eden Medina? Eden Medina says, First, Allende and Popular Unity, which was his coalition, like Stafford Beer, wanted to make structural changes and wanted them to happen quickly. However, they needed to carry out these changes in a way that did not threaten the stability of existing democratic institutions. Second, Allende and his government popular unity, again, did not want to impose these changes on this Chilean people from above. This, the government wanted to ch- wanted change to occur within a democratic framework and in a way that preserved civil liberties and respected dissenting voices. Chilean democratic socialism, like management cybernetics, thus wanted to find a balance between centralized control and individual freedom. Third, the Chilean government needed to develop ways to manage the growing national economy and industrial management constituted one of Beer's core areas of expertise. So a lot of this was an attempt when they were just, you know, all of a sudden nationalizing all of this stuff and bringing all of this power directly to the Chilean government. Um, A lot of it was an attempt to kind of not have it go the authoritarian route of the Soviet Union when it comes to economic planning. But it was also one of the reasons they reached out to Stafford Beer to help was because, like, not a lot of these people who were going to have to be running or at least managing this information flow of the new, like, centralized economy um, had the skills really to do that and so they needed to find a way that like you said all of these companies that maybe they hadn't thought about nationalizing but that the workers were like no we're going to be nationalizing this here you go um they needed to find ways to organize this economy and um so that's why they reached out to stafford Mm -hmm. some good ideas dan i'll say that yeah yeah yeah. and one of the early premises of the book that eden medina puts forward is that she's trying to show that there is this corollary between the democratic socialist aspirations of the end of government and mm. the nature of the form of cybernetic management theory that is promoted by Stafford Beer, yeah. which, because it is also, as you say, like for want of a better word, like democratic or at least like yeah. um, centralized only when it needs to be and tries to eschew and avoid unnecessary um, centralization. Um, it's much more interested in horizontal communication rather than vertical communication. Absolutely. Unless yeah. the vertical is necessary kind of thing. Or yeah. the hierarchy to avoid hierarchy where it's unnecessary. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've heard Dan and I. <laughs> I'm not going to say complain about our jobs. I would never say that because we love our jobs. <laughs> but um, where we both work, I work uh, in a in like a warehouse in kind of like a retail setting, um, and the structure is very typical. It's me, the schmuck doing the work, the like you know crappy stuff and then there's I mean great stuff and then there's my supervisor who directly supervises me then there's management and then management reaches off to its little nodes of like you know advertising sends them stuff and you know they do that and and uh, you know the price people send them their prices and updates and then you know supposedly my manager as a boss or but they're never in the building whatever um, and at least in my personal experience so many problems come from that structure of just only vertical communication, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, if I have a problem, I guess I could go to my manager, but there's no way I'm going to anybody above my manager, right? Because I've never seen them before in my life and never had any communication with them at all. And it's very frustrating, at least in kind of like this setting, where it's like, I think I've said this before in the show, but it's like, we get so much stock that we don't need, and there's constantly stuff that we don't have that we need. And a lot of that I just attribute to, like, maybe just, you know, market trends of just, like, people buying more horse bullshit at times than not others. But a lot of it seems to be, like, when I notice that, like, we don't have a lot of something, there's no there's no route for me or even my supervisor, really, at all to, like, be like, yeah, we need this. Mm -hmm. we, to, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. to circumvent management and go directly to whoever orders the stuff and be like, hey, we need more of this. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's, yeah. There's also no way for you to, like jump over your manager to exactly. communicate directly higher up because, because like one of the things in Stafford Beer's model is that it ought to be possible yeah. for the people at the sort of coal face as it were to be able to communicate um right to the top to some extent yeah but also like I'm sure there are problems yeah you could communicate problems horizontally between people yeah. working at, <laughs> yeah like at the distribution center say yeah it would be useful if you or um you as a collective of workers could communicate yeah. directly with the collective of workers at the distribution center kind of thing yeah. or perhaps your manager could, could direct communicate exactly. with the manager at that center rather than like exactly. having to go all the way up to come all the way back down and some of the system kind of thing yeah um yeah so that yeah, some yeah. of the things we don't have are like it's so predictable it's like depending on what day i go in it's like oh i know, I know exactly have this. Not <laughs> it's like you know we're gonna have 50 million of these things that we're never gonna sell and it's just like oh great more pig troughs awesome uh -huh, uh -huh. um um it's an entirely predictable system being entirely yeah. mismanaged exactly exactly yeah and it's interesting because it kind of gets into this idea of like how systems work to propagate themselves right which is really interesting not something i really know a whole lot about but it seems like one of the main things that stafford beer was also trying to fix in different systems, complex systems, was the idea of like, when a system, a complex system like an economy or a business, corporation, something like that, gets running for a long time, these problems kind of ossify, right? Mm -hmm. And they get very rigid and the system just wants to propagate itself instead of actually coming to, you know, actually interacting with its environment and s communicating with itself and seeing how it can be dynamic to change itself in an adapting environment, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it seems like what he was trying to do with this economy was, with Chile's economy was, you know, say there's a, a trucker's strike, we might come to that later <laughs> on in the book, that was organized by a foreign nation, um, that messes up the supply chain in one area. It's very hard for a rigidly hierarchical system to, ju to fix that quickly, right? If the people who are like on the ground know the strike's coming or whatever's going to happen can't communicate with anyone at like, quote unquote, like above them or horizontal to them to get this fixed, get other trucks, you know, get a different factory to supply this part of the country, it's not going to happen. And so that was one of the main ideas behind his, you know, systems theories is that like, well, yeah, I don't know. It's it's to to make sure that there is communication all along the system, but it's also to make sure that a system is constantly dynamic and it's not just trying to perpetuate itself, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I think it seems like they did a very good job yeah. before it all fell apart. <laughs> but I guess we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it every time Stafford Beer's theories come up in this book, it's very clear that he's really committed to action. Yeah, and really horrified by sort of ossification yeah. and uh, bureaucracy and things happening uh, just because that's the way they've always happened. Exactly. Um, and he's really interested in how systems can 
regulate themselves in a way which is evolutionary to some extent. Yeah. Like a a a viable system mm. for Ooh. Stafford Pier <laughs> um, is one that can um, interact with its environment and almost automatically find the correct adaptations to its functioning to um, to adapt to its new environment. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that gets in the way of that uh, seems to be like. Well, this sort of like bureaucratic ossification, but also a lack of communication between different elements of a system, right? So if every element of the system um, is one of the things he says quite often happens in very complex systems is that um, elements of the system become very committed to ensuring the survival of their own element of the system. But nobody's taken responsibility for considering the survival of the system in its entirety, which would potentially need to change in order to. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it might necessitate some evolution and change in the function of the system itself. Mm. But um, systems quite often become far too conservative to be able to adapt, kind of thing. Mm. Um, mm. Seems there's, a, there's, a, there's a point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a point where Stafford Beer describes himself as a revolutionary. Uh, yeah, in the I... sense that. Well, the sense that it's meant to mean, I think, is that, as I've just described, kind of thing, he's very keen on big change, structural big change. structural rapid yeah. change. Yeah. Um, and this is another way in which his philosophy and outlook overlapped with what Allende was trying to do, um, because the Allende, Allende administration realised they had to make change very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and this is why yeah. the two complement each other so well. Yeah. Should we... We're kind of all over the should place. We do, should we... Should we do a little uh what is cybernetics should we can we oh can we <laughs> oh dear lord yeah. i was gonna say do you want why... to run through that history at all no <laughs> uh the hit well no I no mean, I, I mean i can i can do it what you want to, well sure. i could start it at least um i could just monologue for a bit by all um, means i don't but i don't know what your suggestion was going to be I, w- I mean i don't know i was i was gonna say should we we could talk about this this like this idea of what you're saying about the structural change right that he was trying to make and about how in this whole experiment with planning an economy there seemed to be a kind of a dissonance in everything that was being done in stafford beer's mind and in in just in this terms of like i want a big structural change without like the potential you know (laughs) big epoch defining events that will make that happen Mm -hmm. and also i think that parallels very nicely with the social democracy of allende you know what i mean and i think i don't know yeah, we can talk about this now, we can talk about it later, but I think that, like, the main thing is when we talk about social democracy, we're kind of still talking about keeping a lot of the existing frameworks and just doing things like nationalizing, right? And we see how the backlash in this story to Allende attempting to nationalize, like, huge sectors of his economy got from the capitalist class, right? And we see that it's, like, while it's really respectable what he was doing and he was doing it in the best way possible, kind of half in, half out, right? There was He certainly wasn't about to plunge his country into civil war, mm-hmm. into revolution, mm-hmm. anything like that. I find parallels with Stafford Beer's um, ways of thinking because he is this dude that is like, and again, wasn't really a socialist. He was like a Fabian. I think they described him as like a Fabian labor, right? When he came to uh, Chile. I see his theories as really wanting big structural change and as he as you said he said you know revolution in the way that we do things but at the same time i don't think he really saw like uh how hard that was going to be to do without Mm -hmm. pissing off the capitalist class and this reaction that inevitably came right so it's interesting because Obviously, I'm not advocating for, like, the anarchist way of organizing things, which is to not, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And there needs to be some kind of balance if you're really going to take, like, uh, a realistic adult view of the way things need to change. But I don't know. Do you see what I'm saying with Stafford Beer's theories? Because it definitely seemed like he wanted big structural change and he could see that it needed to happen, but he wasn't willing to kind of, like, have the oomph. You know yeah, I mean... mean um He's described very definitely as not being a Marxist. Yeah, sure. Um, and I don't know what his... Exp- we haven't got to a point yet where his interactions with people involved in this um, uh, experiment in democratic socialism in Chile, whether those people had any influence on him 
and the, whether his politics were changed in any way. Yeah. Um, but you could certainly make the argument, I think, that his theories, particularly the application of his management theories to um, managing a economy, which is more more broadly a political system, lacked from for having or it it it, la- it was lacking in a analysis based on class. Yeah, sure. And if you came at this with an understanding of class interest mm. um, and class conflict, you might then be more prepared to have to write into your system how is a, another class going to react and what are we going to have to do to mitigate yeah. um, that threat. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, it is interesting that it, it, it does seem to be... Well, there's a few things, right? It seems very much to be an effort to have a really thoroughly, thoroughgoing revolutionary break with capitalism yeah um without having the sort of like social strife and discord that might potentially come along with that yeah um that said if it is a sort of like transition what appears to be quite an effort of a rapid transition to something that might be described as a socialist economy my general sense from what i've gotten so far is that like um the theoretical aspirations of this kind of um, cybernetic management theory do seem to gel very well yeah. with the the political aspirations. Mm. By which I mean that it 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 does seem plausible that one can um, have sufficient regard for how severe a break one has to have with the existing system. But to also manage that transition, mm. uh, in some way. Yeah, exactly. Now, and now, um, I know vaguely how this story ends, and it's not good, <laughs> right? He's um, not the president still. <laughs> oh no! I cancel my trip to Chile. <laughs> I know how the story ends, but I don't know whether, don't know to what extent that ending is implicated in, um the sort of, for want of a better word, like technocratic effort to transition to socialism. Now, obviously, like you can, the, the, you could say that the fall of Allende mm. could potentially, was like, was partially at least caused by his unwillingness to um, recognize that there might be this threat uh, for, of violence from uh, sectors of society from the military. Sure. And if his movement had prepared for that, if they'd built up a sort of counter-military power to that, yeah. Um, what difference would that have made, kind of thing? But it would have been bloody. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, it's not an ennoble aspiration to want to avoid bloodshed. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> totally. Of course. I, yeah. I just think it's interesting seeing the kind of parallels between. So, like, I, quite... Okay, I'm just going to say, I have no idea how it, I end day and beer would have done anything differently, and it seems like potentially they took the best course of action other than maybe preparing for the inevitable, mm-hmm. which seems like they kind of didn't. Um, but yeah, I just think it's interesting, the parallels between um, the s- theories of social democracy and uh, just beer's general ideas. Um, boy, I sure hope that gun that Fidel Castro gave him doesn't get used for any nefarious mm. purposes. We'll see. We'll read on to see. Um, well, sh- okay, so should we actually try and talk... In- how are we going to do this in depth about some of Beer's ideas? Well, we can, yeah, we can talk about, we can uh, make an effort to talk about what we can remember. And yeah. if we can't remember it, we'll just cut All it. All right. It's yeah, fine. we'll just cut I it. I don't know. I'm editing this one. I'll be ruthless. It's fine. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, I'll be kind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this episode was five minutes long. Yeah. It's <laughs> all right. We spent 45 minutes talking about the, <laughs> yeah, tr- exactly. the Trump coup. The damn so coup. <laughs> um, Liberty Machine VSM. Fiber systems model. Yeah. Um, I got. I got a lot of I notes want to for start the with, okay, okay. Oh, okay. So what do you want to do? I was going to start with Norbert Wiener. Oh, by all means, please. <laughs> this is actually this is no, very interesting. I mean, I mean, the term, the term. I, I, I mean, I, I, I feel like it's quite nice to explain the origins of the term cybernetics sure. because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's become so incorporated into our lexicon that like. Yeah cyber and some aspect of that just automatically means technology machine cyberpunk, right? like that kind of Cyber thing. Um, 
cybernetics as a term is most uh, readily attributed to this guy, Norbert Wiener, mm. who was working during the Second World War at MAT uh, for... MAT? MIT. Oh, MIT. For the sort of American military. Mm. Um, he coined the term cybernetics, um, as I understand it. Um, it the, the term comes from a Greek word, uh, which both means steersmanship. The, mm. the, 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 the Greek term refers to the person who directed all of the people who were manning the oars on uh, some sort of warship. Some kind of warship. Mm. Kind of <laughs> um, although apparently it can also mean governor as well. Mm. But I like the idea of steersmanship. Mm. Um, basically, him and a collaborator of his were tasked with creating a new kind of anti-air gun mm. turret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and basically the approach that they took to it was to treat both the turret and the the person manning that turret as being one system in and of itself. Mm. Um, the man and the machine. The man and the machine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically they were trying to de develop a device that would steady the aim of the gun. Um it would kind of like react to the inputs that the person gave, but didn't just react like that. Yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. But I think it thing. had some way of both compensating for um, the the feedback that was coming from the gun, but also the inputs that were coming from the human operator of the gun. It was fallible in some way. Um, and they, they took a lot of their uh, inspiration from conversations and interactions that they had with neuroscience. Mm. So basically, this it basically led to this field where um, a field of study which was um, brought together uh, people in the human sciences as well as people in um, uh, mechanical sciences, people mm. in uh, who were developing pieces of technology and interested in the functioning of machines. But um, it led to a development. Of um, or it developed into an approach to um, system modeling, particularly in the US, which was very much interested in how can we take complex systems and quantify them in such a way as we can put them into our models? How can we sort of like, yeah, how can we uh, quantify elements in a complex system so that we can computerize and digitize them so that we can come up with all it, it basically all came to supplement a process of data analysis um uh the most sort of like terrifying to some extent example of this was all of the modeling that was done in the early stages of the vietnam war mm. robert mcnamara was really involved and obsessed with this process of like how much stuff can we quantify um, how much can we sort of like mechanize decision making to some extent? But it was basically based on like, um, how can we take in all this information and then use that information to dictate or orchestrate or propagate uh, that the, the the process of fighting that war kind of thing? So clearly, this was this was feeding into a type of information science, which was very much about accumulating as much data as possible, and then allowing the person at the top of the hierarchy to make the best decisions based on um, this, uh, based on this rampant collection of information and data. I suppose the, this sort of basically U.S. Um, form of cybernetics in the book is compared or is contrasted rather to um, a British form of cybernetics which was pioneered by Stafford Veer uh, but also some other, some other people as well Ross Ashby which took a lot more of its inspiration from uh, psychology and started to build models based on uh, the human brain but also other bio biological systems more broadly which were adaptive at their at their various levels rather than one which needed to be have central coordination and this led to the development of uh what be called um management cybernetics that was his branch of cybernetics is called management cybernetics um and as you say 
Beers two sort of like main contributions to this field as it relates to uh, the Chilean experiment were his ideas about a liberty machine <laughs> and the viable systems model, mm. his model for what a viable system would look like and how it would operate. One of which sounds a lot cooler than the other one. <laughs> liberty you machine mean the viable sounds... systems model? Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> liberty machine sounds like something that like Trump protesters would take into the Capitol that's like some sort of like mech robot. Uh-huh, the liberty uh-huh, machine. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It has a noose tied to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, very well explained. Um, okay. Should I attempt to follow that up with an? If you got a relevant very, point, that a, would be very helpful to have to have a, a very uh, surface level explanation oh, of the viable systems unit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Model. Jesus, I already messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as Dan said. Viable Systems Model and the Liberty Machine were these two ideas of management cybernetics that Stafford Beer bought to Chile, okay? I'm going to completely ignore the Liberty Machine and just talk about the Viable Systems Model because that kind of seems to be the thing that the left has really grafted itself on to, or at least attempted to, um, recently. It's kind of like, like we said, it's the new fad. So if we think about what the Viable Systems Model is as not just a model for any and all systems, but let's specifically relate it to let's say, how a business would run and um, Beer's kind of example that he uses as a metaphor for different types of more complex systems, um, the human nervous system, right? So it, the system in his mind is split into five parts, five different kind of subsystems, right? The first system is equivalent to like, uh, like sensory level experiences, right? It's like uh, touch, meaning the skin, that's one system. Uh, it's hearing, it's smelling, it's, you know, different sensory experiences. Mm-hmm. It's interacting directly with your local environment. Mm-hmm. And so if you think about that on like a business level, how this could apply to like a business, it would be, uh, you know, people on the ground directly running the business, right? Kind of day to day. Schmucks like Jack unloading the deliveries in his warehouse. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Schmucks like us. Yeah. 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 Um, any correction so far? No, 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 no. Okay. I mean, uh, I was also going to add like, I think organs also fit into the sort of sure. like system one mm. from a from a biological perspective. Um, the sort of bodily organs are connected to the environment. I think. Yeah. And also like, operating relatively autonomously. I don't know whether you. Yeah. Sort of like... Sure. Yeah. yeah so exactly. like the so the. The, the the various elements of system one, the sense organs, mm. the 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 various um, factories of a particular industry, say, are seen to well, I mean, in a, in a, in, a, in the the body in in the in terms of how your body functions, like or or an organic system functions, so many things happen autonomously. Uh, they happen without any kind of like central yeah. oversight or control like without you really thinking like i need to breathe yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. or like all of your organs operate yeah your mm. your heart just you don't have to think to make your heart beat kind of thing um and i think this the same applies to like um a business or an economic system right like at least the, you would th- you would want it you to. would like it to you yeah. would like it to be the case that the workers in the factory the workers in the warehouse the workers in the distribution center mm. operate with a degree of autonomy that doesn't require constant oversight. Yeah. There only needs to be oversight if problems Something goes arise. Kind of. and, and you, yeah, exactly. And it's important to imagine that, again, Beer isn't saying this as a socialist. He's not saying that like workers control because just like the workers, bro, come mm-hmm. on, dude. Mm-hmm. He's saying it is because this would work better. He's saying that the more autonomy, basically his viable systems model, whether it's for a complex system like the whole economy, like what he was doing in Chile or just for a business, the whole point is that it's basically autonomous. Yeah, just yeah. think of it like that. It just runs itself. And the only time different systems come into play, the ones that we'll talk about here in a sec, are when something goes wrong, when something isn't supposed to happen. Happens. Yeah, or for future a viable planning. system is one that exists in a state of homeostasis, a state yeah. of like equilibrium. Yeah. And all the elements, all the parts of that system need to be given the liberty to find their equilibrium state to some extent, I think. Yeah. Um, and if there isn't, if, if there is constant disruption from a, a superior sort of management level. Yeah. Um, they can kind of interfere. You're, yeah, you're not going to achieve the necessary degree of homeostasis. Yeah. And this is kind of why I brought up the example earlier of like 
we have too much stock, we don't have enough stock, just let the workers who are there interacting with the customers who know what they need and all of this and know what's in the warehouse, blah, 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 let them do it. That's the general idea. System two, Dan, we move not really up. System two is basically a system of communication, I guess. He kind of, in uh, the organic sense, he compares it to the spinal cord because it brings information kind of up and down between the various organs, um, but also to <laughs> system three. So basically system two, it's not much to talk about. It's just a series of horizontal, horizontal, mm -hmm. horizontal and kind of vertical uh, communication. Right? Sure, yeah. It, facilit yeah. it facilitates the kind of communication between, as we were describing earlier, between like shop floor and shop floor. Yeah. Or between the managers of one shop floor and the managers of another shop floor. Or, or between whatever organization manages the operation of one shop floor. Or any combination. With a, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, with another one without then needing to be to go through a sort of like vertical level of uh, coordination kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I don't think there's much else to say about that. It is basically just, it's quick, I guess is another way of saying it. Rapid lateral communication. It's not something that gets caught up on bureaucracy hierarchies it's like oh you need to talk to this person talk to them right um easy easy kind of easier said than yeah, done yeah, yeah. in chile's well, kind of example this would potentially be workers on the shop floor in one factory or in a mine communicating with another factory or communicating with managers slightly higher up than themselves to communicate potential problems or um shortages over productions things like that mm -hmm. yeah system three System three, he equates to the cerebellum and a couple other parts of the brain. It's not. This is, this is where my knowledge of biology starts to fail. And I, I was like, like nasal ganglia. These things are. <laughs> <laughs> so, my understanding of the brain, of which I have one, is that the cerebellum is. It, it functions autonomously, thankfully. Yeah, completely <laughs> autonomously. It's a black box. <laughs> it's indeed a black box. Um, cerebellum, not the mass of gray matter, right? So all of our medical listeners are going to be like, oh, duh, we know all this. Um, but the cerebellum and the other parts of the brain, um, the ganglia, if you will, um, this system is above system one and two, and it is basically responsible for the management of all day-to-day -day operations, okay? So this is just here and now managing problems as they come up, Here's what you need to do to keep things running. That's all it is. Think of it as like, in the Chile analogy, it's like maybe a series of dudes in an office who would be like, uh, oh, factory number one has this problem. Okay, how can we fix it? Okay, go send some more trucks over there. You know, there's a CIA-backed uh, trucker strike. I'll fix that over here, right? Um, anything to say on that? On uh, well, no, I, 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 I had sort of convinced myself that, um, you know, before when we were talking about um, problems occurring whereby one element of a system becomes too fixated on its own operation and sure. doesn't have a bigger picture view. Um, I sort of thought that element, to some extent, was system three. Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm now not sure whether that analogy is quite correct. Mm. Um, should I just should I, I have a couple of quotes highlighted about system three? Sure, should why just read not? Real quick. System three, which Beer equated to the pons, medulla, and cerebellum of the brain monitors the behavior of each organ, which is system one, as well as the organ's collective interaction and keeps the body functioning properly under normal conditions. It's responsible for internal and immediate functions of the enterprise, the here and now and day-to-day -day management. However, system three does not receive data on all aspects, and this is actually very important, all aspects of system one's operation, only the information deemed most important. This filtering allows System 3 to grasp the totality of what is taking place without being overwhelmed by the minutiae. So that's another big thing in Stafford Spears' theory is that management, one of the reasons that it fails a lot is because it gets too much information. It just doesn't, it's just like, this is too much to deal with. Mm -hmm. Again, let the people on the shop floor work it out. They know what they're doing. They'll figure it out. You just need to know what you need to know to keep things running smoothly. That's System 3. Sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Pond. Uh it's just a part of the brain. I thought it was funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, bu I looked, you know, bemused. Bemused. Okay. But it also has something else that it does, which relates to system four. Okay. System four, again, only a Brunel, bio I don't even know how to say it. Biology nerds will care about this. It's the third ventricle of the brain, the diencephalon, and the basal ganglia. Um... Don't worry about that at all. What it is, is the system that sits above system three, and it 
filters communication up to system five. Don't worry about that for right now. Um, but even though it sits above system three, don't think of it like a boss. It's one thing that he really tried to say. This is something that isn't concerned with day-to-day -day management. It's concerned with information processing as it relates to the future of the system, the enterprise, mm -hmm. the economy, things like that. Um, it's concerned... I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess that's pretty much it. It's concerned with information processing as it relates to the future. And yes, yeah, also, yeah. like... To some extent, yeah. this is why I was thinking system three was more of the, like the singular node that might become obsessed with its own oh, functioning. Sure. Sure. But for system four being there, being like, okay, long-term picture, mm. what do we need? What don't we need? How are things going to develop? Mm. Um, but maybe maybe the analogy isn't quite old. Maybe, yeah, maybe connected, describing system three in that fashion isn't necessarily correct. Mm. Um, because uh, system four is kind of like... Uh, long-term thinking rather than overall management of the system. Mm. Uh, it's sort of planning for the future in a way that System 3 is, a, is concerned with present yeah. day-to-day. -day exactly, of. exactly. Uh, and maybe it's also... more System 5, which is more interested in the overall uh, functioning and continued survival of the system in and of itself. Yeah, so System 5. Mm. <laughs> uh, the cerebral cortex, Dan, if you will. Um System five is if you were to just look at this and kind of have a background in modern or maybe not modern, but like typical corporate um, functioning, you'd be like, oh, this is the CEO. But it's like, no, that's explicitly not the point of system five, even though it sits at the top of everything. System five, all it does is it resolves like the most dire of conflicts between different systems. Right. But um, it maintains coherence, et cetera, et cetera. But it also is like, a series of many managers coming together to really toss information downwards about the future development of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So whereas system four is basically the, the information processing for the future of the enterprise, system five is the one that kind of gets this information and decides what it is and sends it downwards to be collated mm -hmm. and uh, so forth and so forth. Yeah, and as you say, some, some force has got to um, arbitrate between that the section of a system which is purely concerned with day to day, and that section of a system which is concerned with big picture, sort of future term thinking. Yeah. Um, because without something to mediate between those two, obviously those two could be come into conflict, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's important to, as Eden Medina does, to um, show that there is a difference between. Uh, to categorize systems one, two, and three as one thing, and four and five as kind of a different thing. Systems one, two, and three are all about the here and now, and they're all about actually running things. And because only the most important, dire, like disasters information, on that's the only stuff that gets filtered up from one, two, and three to four and five, that leaves four and five completely free to decide on the future of what's going to happen, which is extremely important because you can't just have this system of day-to-day -day running get all the way bought up to system five where it's concerned with how things are being run and all the what's going on today what's going on with that it doesn't get any of that information that frees it up to be dynamic which is the most important part of all these systems right that it's not rigid it's not ossified and that it's all uh communicating with itself also important to say <laughs> that systems uh systems one i guess and three obviously but system one can in a time of extreme crisis communicate directly with systems four and five if it needs to um so again just another example of it being dynamic he had a fun name for it but i'm not gonna look okay. it up it was cool yeah um so i hope you all understood that <laughs> easily i hope you've all been taking notes yeah. on a diagram <laughs> in in the description we'll put a link to basal some sort of... ganglia <laughs> yeah, exactly i think i called it nasal ganglia nasal earlier ganglia. Whoops. <laughs> um in the description we'll put a link to some sort of I don't know, like image of as, as if, as if that's going to help. Yeah, <laughs> it should. If you're following along with the image, it should. I'm glad I'm telling you this now that I've finished describing <laughs> the Bible systems model. But that's all to say that this was bought to Chile because with all of the nationalizations that were happening, it was just going to be impossible to deal with all this information. And Stafford Beer's idea of like too much information can overload management, uh, leave it to the people at the lower levels, uh, vibed very well with what, you know, they needed to do to run this economy as they were trying to centrally plan an economy, but also with socialism to a certain extent. So there you go. That's sure, why the bottom yeah, yeah. end. Yeah. yeah. This chocolate eating, whiskey drinking, yoga doing, cigar smoking gringo. Um, 
<sighs> Boy, that was, that was a lot to get through. Um, Thank you for that, Jack. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if you're at home being like, okay, what what's what's the relevance of any of this? Um, <laughs> Please tell to me. So, <laughs> to, to some extent, I hope we've already made it evident yes. that um, management cybernetics, as pioneered by Stafford Beer, was really keen to to keen to avoid. Um, purely hierarchical management and wanted instead to work out how to have networks of communication which could um, facilitate and find fixes to problems without there having to be uh, central directives directing the Absolutely, whole thing. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and I feel like to some extent this kind of, a model such as this or thinking along these lines um can begin to answer sort of like people's gut reaction when you say you want workers control of mm. uh, a planned economy. Fa uh, yeah, factories or something. Yeah. Or like, um, to say like then how how would such a thing be directed? Yeah. Why wouldn't it be anarchy kind of thing? Yeah. This is the Margaret Thatcher there is no alternative killer. <laughs> because this is legitimately, this is something you can point to as when people say, but wouldn't planning an economy Okay, lay it out on the line. We need to have a planned economy if we're going to survive <laughs> as a species, right? Uh, for a multitude of different reasons. But, you know... Unless someone... we're going to go back to, like, small-scale uh, agrarian... Like, I'm not farming. against that. Mm. Well, maybe... Well, <laughs> um, but if you were to tell me that five years ago, I'd be like, okay, well, there's no way you can possibly get that much information and deal with it in a centrally planned way. Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. And obviously this isn't the answer to everything, but... I mean, my God, this is a way that it was done and yeah. was being done well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, I don't know whether it was done well, but uh, <laughs> it, it, if this country mm. that had like 50 very out-of-date computers yeah. and four sort of like relatively modern supercomputers in the entire country, I, I'm mm. misusing the terminology, but mm. you know what I mean, four n moderately advanced computers. In the 70s. In the, Yeah, in the <laughs> early 70s were willing to try or it was conceivable that the nationalized sections of this economy uh could at least be attempted to be run under those conditions what could we do now in the contemporary yeah. computer age I mean, yeah like... exactly and so i forget i heard something once i don't know if it was otto neurath or somebody like that uh, maybe I shouldn't have named dropped because I have no idea who it was. But when they were attempting to plan an economy for the Soviet Union, they were like, oh my God, there's way too much information to be done here. Like, you know, say if you're going to make a door, it's like, okay, you need to know where the wood's going to come from. How much wood we have. You need to know about the paint. Oh my God, what makes the paint? We need lead. We need this. We need pigments. Oh my God, my table's already 50 million times long. And all I'm doing is making a door. The point that some god damn, I wish I could remember who it was, but someone made the point where it's like, oh, if you're making input output tables, you don't need like information for every single bit of like timber and cotton that's in the economy. You only need what you're gonna make for the door. You only need the stuff for paint, you only need the stuff for timber, you only need like this. It's kind of a similar thing here about like the term black boxing, which is like when you're trying, when you're going up against such a complex system as an economy, you don't need all the information. And that sounds counterintuitive, but you know, there's this idea in systems theory of black boxing where it's like, okay, let's say you have uh, a switch and a bunch of complex uh, circuit boards, and then on the other side, there's a light, right? If you turn the switch on, the light goes on, turn it off, the light goes off. You have no idea what's going on in the circuit boards. So you just put a little black box over it and all you can do is monitor the inputs and the outputs and you know what happens from there. It's a similar idea. Mm -hmm. Sounds crazy, can be done. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen, as we probably will talk about in the future, it's done by the most successful corporate entities um, around. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. how they've been able to survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whew, so there yeah. you go. <laughs> the government might not plan. Yeah. But corporations definitely do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, the analogy of a black box is quite good because it's um, it's basically saying that, well, ex exceedingly complex systems, you can apply some kind of management to hmm. if you're willing to view things in aggregates rather than yeah. have a desire to understand exactly how much 
things mean kind of thing. So yeah. your example of the switch and the light coming on, so long as the light comes on like 95% of the time, yeah. you can leave, those 95% of things can be assumed to happen. And mm -hmm. then you can have these sort of emergency reactions for the times when things don't work quite the way you expect them to. Yeah. And you can sort of like take make certain assumptions about your system you don't have to control the whole thing kind of thing. There's another thing that's just sprung into my mind. So much in this book, there's this emphasis put on things happening in real time. Yeah. They want real yeah, yeah. time information. Exactly. Because if you think of like early Soviet planning or how you imagine Soviet planning, like how is, or, or people's caricatures of the failures of Soviet planning, mm. you're like, how are we going to know in six months' time yeah. how many of X size of shoe we're going to want <laughs> or like mm. X piece of this, that or the other kind of thing? Um, but this is not the kind of planning which is happening like we're planning for the future. Yeah. It's the kind of planning which is how can we intercede directly in the economy now when there are crises or how can we sort of like or maybe if not even to avoid crisis, how can we have like minor adjustments at all levels? How can we write into the entirety of this system mm. this kind of like self-writing mechanism? Mm. Um, this autonomy. Yeah, quite. Yeah. How can you you foster autonomy in uh, the system and have at it all levels? Work for everybody. It's almost like, Dan, does this vibe with socialism? It's weird. Maybe. Very maybe, weird. Maybe. Some extent, Proper some extent. organization for systems actually yeah, vibes yeah. with socialism. Call me crazy. <laughs> um, I did, I did kind of want to get your thoughts too on like how this could potentially, this information, maybe we should read a bit more of the book, but I mean, now that we've kind of gotten like a cursory glance at the VSM and about um, different ideas of like cybernetic planning, um, how this stuff could potentially be applied to a party in some way. Now, like, I, you know, I really have no idea. I don't really know how a lot of parties are organized, but it seems to me a lot of left-wing, proper left-wing parties are just recreating a lot of bourgeois forms, uh, or at least typically ossified forms of political parties. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So you see something like the DSA in America, it's like, I mean, this is just like a nominally more left-wing democratic party. It's not really changing much of the hierarchy of like the way these things function. You know what I mean? Maybe, I, mean, I don't know that... The DSA, um, I mean, for criticisms that I've heard of the DSA seems to be, it seems to lack from centralism yeah. Yeah. to some extent. Sure. <laughs> like, sure. it's got a lot of the... It's Maybe got I said the way it of... wishes it operates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all to say that this systems theory stuff can, obviously we would need it to be applied to a planned economy, but it can be applied to a lot of other stuff. And, you know... You hear a lot of like the classic like m you know Maoist jokes about like Maoist parties how they're always expelling somebody from the top. You know what I mean? They're always like you know like have, uh, we saw that you liked this tweet that didn't really go along with our party platform. Could mm -hmm. you please talk to us about that? Um, I don't well, know. It's, 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 we have so many like communist sects mm. that basically every time you have an election for. Um, <laughs> the central committee, which is elected as a slate, right? So they just yeah. elect the entirety of one group of people who hold one particular opinion. Mm. And then they have to expel the entirety of the old, <laughs> the, the sort of opposition slates because, like, yeah. I don't know, like, mm. yeah, yeah. Not exactly viable systems. Not exactly viable systems, indeed. No, no, no. It's all, yeah, I don't know. It's all interesting. Let I, us know. If you're, in a, if you're in a communist sect, does it feel like a viable system? Let us know. Unless you're a cop, don't let us know. <laughs> um, I don't you know. I guess that's why I was getting... I was very excited about reading this. Because it just seemed like the possibilities for using the systems theory... They seemed almost endless. Yeah, yeah, Should yeah. we institute it in our workflow for the podcast? We I want to be... We can at least think about it. Should... <laughs> what should I be? I'll be system two. I want to be the basal ganglion. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> This will never work. Um, yeah, this um, book rocks. Excited to read more. Yeah, yeah, I'm very keen to... We haven't gotten to the point where the next chapter is the efforts to implement yeah. um, this type of cybernetics. Yeah. And to, how to develop an actual system. That AK-47 that Fidel Castro gave to him is looking great on the mantelpiece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll purely decorative. Screw it in purely there, decorative. it's never going to move. <laughs> it's purely decorative, not loaded. What's that? <laughs> it's loaded? <laughs> Um, so yeah, there you go. Exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. Return mm -hmm. to us next time when we discover what will happen to our uh, drunken yogi friends and his Chilean comrades. Um, the bear. The bear. The bear. Yeah, well, Fernando <laughs> Flores. Flores. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, quite a large chap. It was a large fellow. 
Yeah. yeah. There's that one photo of them that was so cool. It's like Stafford beard, very long beard. Long hair. Very, yeah, just like a weird looking He does guy. not look like a business consultant at all. <laughs> he does not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Apparently he never... It was in this that it said that he never got... I was listening to something that... Uh, what's her name? Eden Medina was giving a talk on this book. I think she might have said that he never got a BA. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. He, 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 <laughs> he, he went to university just before the outbreak of the Second World War yeah. and was studying wow, for wow. a few years and then was drafted into the war. Yeah. And... Um, I think he lectured after, like... He, he only died in he 2002. Was given, he... he, he yeah, 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 he lived Crazy. for a very long time. I yeah. mean, there are some quotes from... Yeah, Eden and Medina conducted interviews with him. Yeah, it's so, so there cool. are there are little bits when... Um, there are little bits. My favourite yeah. favorite quote is his was when he described um, <laughs> described his reaction oh, to yeah. receiving the invitation to come to Chile as him having an orgasm. <laughs> yeah, and that was the only quote. It's just those words. Yeah, it was, I had, I had an, an orgasm. Yeah. And she moves on, it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, suffice to say, um, Stafford Beer was very keen. Very keen. Very I keen. like too. Where apparently after it was he... quite. It was a really very fortuitous series of events because he was like. It was only in the late sixties and early seventies when he was really beginning to develop these ideas, whereby his ideas of sort of business management could be applied to more complex systems like economies. Mm. Um, and um, Fernando Flores had no idea that Stafford Beer's thinking had even taken this turning when he sent the invitation to have him come to Chile. Yeah. Um, so it was this sort of like meeting of minds that hadn't really known they were thinking in a similar direction kind of thing. Yeah. Have you ever listened to, um, I listened to the first part of his, he did something for the Canadian Broadcast Corporation. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're Designing awesome. freedom. His voice is like, I shut know, up. I know, I know. So I know. good. Um, apparently good, like, too. audio book voice. Yeah, uh, yeah, go, go and listen to, I'm, I actually, I've never gotten through all of those essays, those, Same, those lectures yeah. and I don't entirely know why. Um, They're long. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're not. They're like half an hour each. <laughs> so long. Maybe his voice time. is so soporific. Maybe that's True. what it is. It's just like, oh, um, tell me about the cat and the, <laughs> and the waves. Don't shoot the cat. And, don't oh shoot yeah, the goddamn cat. The little house where I have come to live alone for a few weeks sits on the edge of a steep hill in a quiet village on the western coast of Chile. Huge majestic waves roll into the bay and crash magnificently over the rocks, sparkling white against the green sea under a winter sun. It is for me a time of peace, a time to clear the head, a time to treasure. Um, last bit on Stanford Beer is that apparently after this all, spoiler alert, falls apart, he uh, came back, taught for a little while at like University of Manchester or something like that, had a little bit of an academic career, and then eventually just moved to Wales in a yeah, yeah, cabin like, that had yeah, no running water yeah, yeah, yeah. and just sat and just hung out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's went, like, like, whoa. Full time because it's, you know, no. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, um, join us next week when we talk about Ted Kaczynski's yeah, manifesto. Yeah. 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 Uh, that, yeah, I enjoyed the bit when, earlier on, when he was talking about his house that he'd got mm. in like Surrey or something. Yeah. Um, which was ne was named like the Firkin or, <laughs> some, or Firkin uh, after <laughs> the measurement, it's a measurement of beer. Oh, okay. Uh, Ooh, had, like, there had like a goldfish pond in his office <laughs> and like a noise activated waterfall <laughs> in his like what? dining room or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Badass. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. It's cool. cool. Sounds like quite a character. Yeah, all of everybody. Uh, that's one thing that really stood out to me too is that everybody involved in this story seemed like everybody's a character. character. Dude. Yeah, yeah, this book is definitely like. Um, it's great story. It's narrative. Mm. It's a great story. It's it a is. great story. It's well written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very exciting. Oh, um, yeah, at least the. Uh, Eden Benita draws out the really fascinating elements of these characters. Yeah. Um, yeah. In her narrative. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Anything it's else? Good stuff. It's good um, stuff. This was introduction, chapter one and two. So we'll eventually get back to this, talk yeah, a little yeah, more yeah. about it. Yeah. Get the book. You can find it for free online, really easily, um, or pay for it. That'd be good too. You pay for it, <laughs> as we did. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there you go. I don't know. What are we talking about? Statements. I'm done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's yeah, thank you very much for joining <laughs> us. For <laughs> All right. Um, see you next time, whatever you want to talk about. Bye bye. The music you heard this episode was Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. 
Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more comedy discussion. Till next time.